And we're live, guys. Thank you very much. Bula, Talofa, and uh, Iakwe. Uh, welcome, everyone. Today is the last day of the 2021 Virtual Pacific Resilience Meeting. And here we are on session 10, Youths in the Face of COVID-19. I am Sevu from IFRC Pacific, and I will be moderating this session with my counterpart, Vivian Costa from the Pacific Youth Council, who is also the PRP Youth Working Group Co-Chair. You might have viewed the speaker's uh, profile on the platform. And here we will go straight into introducing them to you uh, before we start our session. We will have an opening uh, remark from uh, Katie Greenwood, who is the head of the delegation of the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies here in the Pacific. She had spent the last 20 years working with the humanitarian and development organization with much of the last decade being in the Pacific. Katie had started her development career working in education programming and as an advocate for genuine youth participation has carried that background into other technical areas of work, including models of organizational development and leadership. And she is currently based in Suva, Fiji with the IFRC team. And our speakers lineup colleagues, we have Sean Casey, who is the COVID-19 incident manager, acting team coordinator, Pacific Health Security and Communicable Diseases for WHO in the Pacific. We have Dr. Sunia Swakai, Deputy Director for the Public Health Division of the SPC Pacific Community. We have Uwe Namarova, the Secretary General of the Papua New Guinea Red Cross Society. And we have Vani Tanasina, Executive Director of the Fiji Council of Social Services. And lastly, we have Leslie, Tiko Tikoda, a youth, a student, and a disability advocate, who was a coordinator for the Access to Justice Program for Persons Living with Disabilities for the Fiji Disables Federation. He had also represented Fiji to the Melanesian Game in 2016, Oceania Championship, and also the many South Pacific Games. Sean Casey, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sevu, and apologies, good apologies, apologies, Sean. Uh, Katie, uh, we will have an opening remark from uh, Katie Greenwood uh, before we go to Sean Casey. Katie, floor is yours, Vin thank you. Vinaka Sevu and uh, Bula Vinaka, everyone, for uh, joining us right across the region and welcome to today's important session uh, focused on youth in the face of COVID-19. I want to take a moment to acknowledge and thank our co-convener for the session today uh, and say a big uh, vinaka vakalevu to Vivian uh, from PYC for your leadership, as well as to um, thanking Sevu and all the participants of this uh, week's youth forum, uh, which led the way with a thoughtful and energetic set of sessions with some excellent outcomes, which set the tone for the rest of these meetings. Uh, I acknowledge as well the ongoing efforts of the youth participants across these meetings as speakers, facilitators, rapporteurs, and at the national hubs. Um, your active participation is noted and, and very much appreciated. I also thank and acknowledge fellow speakers in, in this session, representing a range of sectors and organizations. Across the Pacific, we have been speaking uh, for many years about a perfect storm looming uh, on the horizon. Many meetings like this one, many research reports, many Talanoa sessions have been held to discuss what happens if the many hazards that we face across the region intersect with the compounding effects of climate change, urban drift, and a rapidly increasing youth population seeking to harness their education, their leadership skills, their motivation and their entrepreneurialism uh, to access livelihoods and be a force for good. And in those circumstances, what happens if our resilience is further tested by a period of economic uncertainty, uh, scarcity, and heaven forbid, a health pandemic? We are currently seeing this play out in our region right now, particularly in PNG and in Fiji. 
But we know that while other Pacific nations may not have a COVID caseload, you are certainly weathering parts of this same storm. And if cases here uh, tell us anything, it is what Dr. Rachel referred to yesterday as the desperate need to prepare uh, through ramping up our vaccination efforts, uh, allowing space for youth leadership on facts-based campaigns targeting misinformation, which is surely the enemy of resilience. I'm struck this morning also by what Shamima, the head of the Women's Fiji Crisis Centre says, in 40 years of her work in the region is an unfolding crisis by Panoa, although a secondary crisis impacting women, men, boys and girls, as patriarchal norms wreak havoc with resilience and coping mechanisms, resulting in violence, self-harm and abuse. We all have to have a renewed focus on working against such harmful norms, which are the same ones telling us that young people need to wait in line to take their place in our communities and institutions later, rather than harnessing their leadership now to um, further our work. For us within the Federation, we are seeing Red Cross national societies rise to action and the perfect storm requires truly localised approaches from grassroots organisations with excellent networks spanning community, government, formal and informal sectors alike. And some research we've undertaken with our volunteers working on COVID responses has certainly highlighted the contributions of young people in the movement. But no one organisation, um, government, can be successful without all of us in this large, coordinated, multi-sectoral, multi-talented and multi-generational network of people ready to rise to the challenge. We all need the space, the support and the resources to play the important roles that we all have. I'm very excited that today's session will take you through not just some of the ways in which young people have been affected by COVID, whether that is missing years of education, being targeted as COVID carriers, or facing uncertainty around economic futures, but also that it will address the ways in which young people are leading the way through this pandemic. So thank you all for uh, being here and participating in this important discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Katie. And uh, now we go to our speaker, uh, Sean Casey from the World Health uh, Organization. Thank you very much, uh, Katie. Thank you very much, Sevu. Uh, my sincere thanks to the organizers uh, of this session and of the uh, program overall. Uh, it's it's a great pleasure to be with you this afternoon, and I'm uh, going to start with an apology. I'm joining you from the car with my mask on because I've just left quarantine, and I'm sharing a car with a colleague, uh, and so I'm going to keep my mask on, uh, which uh, I think you'll all understand is um, a representation of uh, the important role that all of us have in protecting one another. So my brief presentation today is going to be uh, a bit of a scene setter uh, on the COVID situation in the Pacific. Uh, and I'll round off with a few points about actions all of us can take uh, to protect ourselves, our families, and our communities. So this is a summary of where we are today uh, globally. Uh, we've had over 183 million cases confirmed of COVID-19 around the world. And as of yesterday, uh, WHO's Director General uh, reported the very sad milestone that we've now reached over 4 million deaths. Just in uh, the last 24 hours, we've had over 326,000 new cases around the world and over 6,000 new deaths. In our region, in the Western Pacific, uh, we've now had over 3.6 million cases and 17,000 plus of those were in the last 24 hours. And here in the Pacific, we're now more affected um, than we've been throughout the entire pandemic. Uh, in the last 24 hours alone, 
Uh, and these are numbers as of uh, close of business yesterday, as the end of the day yesterday. We had 660 new cases and seven new deaths, including in Fiji, French Polynesia, Guam, and Papua New Guinea. Globally, we see uh, changing trends, uh, shifting dynamics in the pandemic, uh, with significant numbers of new cases reported uh, in the last 24 hours and over the last weeks from India, we see a huge surge now in Indonesia, a resurgence in Brazil, um, and resurgences in other countries in South America um, and in Africa. And as I'll note uh, in subsequent slides, some of this is related to vaccine coverage and equitable vaccine access. Um, but much of it is also related to uh, how we behave and the measures that we follow, uh, what we call non-pharmaceutical interventions um, or uh, COVID safe behaviors. Here in the Pacific, um, these curves represent uh, the, the ep epidemic, the course of the pandemic uh, since it began at, uh, at the beginning of last year. So the smaller inlay is the overall uh, epidemic since April of 2020. And you can see uh, that we've had several waves and actually this excludes PNG, but we had a significant wave uh, towards the end of last year uh, in Guam and French Polynesia in yellow in particular. Uh, earlier this year, we saw a significant wave and I'll, I'll show you that in a moment from PNG. And now obviously we're facing this significant wave with record-breaking caseloads uh, day by day here in Fiji. We have many countries in the Pacific that have not had cases or that have reported only sporadic cases, um, but that doesn't mean that we can uh, rest comfortably and think that it won't happen to us. Um, and it's, uh, as, I'll, as I'll come back to, uh, we can't rely on vaccination alone to protect us. So in Fiji, uh, over the last few days, we've seen record cases. As of the end of the day yesterday, we had over 600 confirmed cases in the prior 24 hour period. And actually the numbers released last night were close to 800 in a 24 hour period uh, with new deaths every day. Uh, so six new deaths confirmed in the 24 hour period, uh, closing at the end of the day yesterday with a significant concentration of um, new cases and deaths in the central division. So in the Lamy, Suva, Nasori corridor. Uh, the seven day average testing uh, is now over uh, 3.7 per 1000 population per day, which actually is uh, uh, a significant success story, I would say in Fiji with some of the highest per capita testing in the world. Um, but unfortunately, along with that high level of testing, we've seen this high level of positivity uh, with an with a increasingly sharp upward trend. In French Polynesia, we've had several waves, uh, and this slide represents the, the waves that we've had uh, since the start of this year. But uh, last year, um, there was a small wave in March 2020 that ended uh, with zero cases and stopping local transmission, and then a new importation of cases in July of last year that led to a significant wave with over 100, well, with 144 deaths uh, in total. The outbreak is ongoing, the population vaccination is scaling up, um, but they are clearly not out of the woods yet with ongoing transmission and additional deaths. In Guam, we've seen steady transmission uh, over the last year. Uh, and they had uh, 21 new cases yesterday and now have a total of 140 deaths. The transmission has come down and vaccination is scaling up significantly. Now 58% of the total population has received a vaccine. And in PNG, we are just kind of on the tail end of a, uh, a surge in cases from March uh, to May of this year that led to uh, at least 17,000 confirmed cases and 177 deaths. We know that uh, the testing rates are uh, somewhat low in Papua New Guinea and that they may not reflect the total caseloads. 
this is a map reflecting the vaccine coverage around the world. And I don't want to zoom in too much on specific countries, but I think it's an important uh, slide to understand the unequitable distribution of vaccines around the world. Uh, and we see that some countries are even now working on delivering booster doses to those who have had two doses, while other countries are still in the single digit uh, percentage coverage, um, meaning that the vast majority of people, including the most vulnerable, have not been vaccinated yet. Here in the Pacific, uh, our vaccine coverage is mixed, but improving very quickly. Um, so you'll see this is uh, this slide represents vaccine coverage as the percentage of the total population. So the eligible population for vaccination is currently lower because those under 18 are not yet eligible for most vaccines. And that's changing. So there are certain vaccines, uh, Pfizer vaccines that are now available to those over 12 years old. Uh, but for the most part, um, those vaccinated are over the age of 18. And so it's not representative of the total population, but those over the age of 18. And we know that the Pacific has a young population. So we see a mixed level of coverage um, with uh, the highest coverage so far in Palau um, and rapidly increasing coverage in Fiji, um, the Cook Islands. Uh, Nauru has a very high uh, first dose coverage rate. And right across the Pacific, we're seeing more vaccines come in. Uh, but it's important to understand that vaccination alone will not end uh, the pandemic and will not provide full protection. So even though we're scaling up vaccination, uh, we've seen in countries like the US with overall high national coverage rates, in Israel with very high national coverage rates, there are resurgence, uh, there are cases of local resurgence of, uh, of cases. And um, actually in Israel, which has over 95% of eligible uh, adults vaccinated, they've just reintroduced mask requirements um, because of a resurgence of cases despite that full vaccination. So I wanna just round this out, um, bringing it back to the Pacific and uh, to youth in particular in the face of COVID. We're, we're seeing um, that while the Pacific has some of the few countries in the world that haven't had local cases or local transmission, more and more countries are seeing leaks from quarantine. Uh, Kiribati recently had cases on board a ship in its harbor. The Solomon Islands recently had the same. And there is travel into the Pacific. There are risks of quarantine leakage. There are risks of importation through maritime channels. And we know that vaccination is still scaling up. And even when it is scaled up, it will not provide 100% protection. So the measures that we know, these COVID safe measures, we know that they are effective, um, but they're only effective if they're really applied right across the population. And there's a critical role for youth to play to prevent transmission and to help protect themselves, but really those around them as well. So we know that COVID-19 affects the elderly and those with comorbidities more than it does young people. But we also know that at the moment, those under 18 are not yet eligible for vaccination in many countries. So it's even more critical that young people continue to contribute to reducing transmission, protecting the members of their household by staying home, using masks con consistently, and following all the measures that we've talked about for the last year and a half. It's a shared responsibility, uh, and it's really one of the only ways that we'll be able to uh, get through this difficult situation together. So I want to thank you for your time and your participation today, and I will stop there. Thanks, Eva, back to you. Uh, thank you, Sean. Sean, uh, just two uh, quick question of, uh, for you, if, just, if you're able just to respond quickly. Uh, the first one is, uh, what example does, um, does other countries have on addressing misinformation uh, circulated uh, on social uh, media? Uh, this is one of the issues that uh, has come across during the vaccination rollout in Samoa. And the second one is, um, what are your thoughts on what steps is necessary to be taken in order to control uh, the outbreak? 
Thanks, Sibu. So on the first question of misinformation, it's a huge challenge in this pandemic response. Uh, there is a huge amount of misinformation circulating on social media, um, in uh, traditional media. And the best thing that everybody can do is refer to trusted sources and not spread rumors. So there's there are lots of trusted sources out there, the ministries of health of our countries, uh, WHO, CDC, uh, and really reliable sources on uh, issues of vaccination, on issues of transmission, on issues of treatment. So the, the first thing I would say is rely on reliable sources and don't contribute to rumors. So don't just share things uh, if you're not sure that they're correct. Uh, if you see a video or you see a post and you're not certain where it comes from, don't hit that share button. Uh, and, and we can stop that misinformation from spreading further. Um, sorry, Sebo, I think the second question you said was about how do we uh, contribute to controlling the pandemic? Uh, yes. So there's, there's a number of things we can do. One is um, vaccine rollout. And uh, we know that vaccines are safe and very effective. Uh, they're particularly effective at preventing severe disease and will help to keep people alive and keep people out of the hospital. What they don't do completely is stop transmission. So the other thing that all of us need to do is continue to apply the COVID safe measures that we all know uh, and um, make sure that we don't contribute to onward transmission. At the same time, even those countries that don't have cases really need to continue to prepare. And I would say actually the countries that don't have cases, those countries in the Pacific that haven't had cases or haven't had local transmission need to have even more emphasis on this because there is a very high uh, possibility that other countries, that countries will um, have cases at some point. Um, travel will reopen at some point. There's always the risk of importation. So all countries need to be prepared to deal with that and have clear alert levels, clear measures in place to uh, track, detect, isolate cases, find and uh, quarantine those contacts, and scale up response if necessary. Um, and Fiji's been going through that uh, these last few weeks in particular, the challenge of going from one or two cases to 10 or 15 cases to hundreds and now thousands of active cases in just a short period of time. So it requires a whole of government response. It requires the, the entire community to contribute to, to those control measures. Uh, and I think it's just important that, that no country feel like they're safe, even as the vaccine rates uh, go up uh, and um, even as they are COVID free uh, in, uh, for the moment. Uh, thank you, Sean. I uh, really appreciate those uh, feedbacks and there are other, uh, we thank all the comments that's uh, coming into the chat box. And now, uh, thank you, Sean. And now we'll move to, to Dr. Sunia. Dr. Sunia, floor is yours. Just a sound check. Um, you see my screen and hear the volume. Yes, we can see your screen, uh, Sonia. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Katie, uh, Sebu, and Sean. Um, the traveling message across the Suva, my good friend, Sean. See you soon. Um, I think as Sean set the scene very well for us. Um, and I'd just like to share some of the work that we've been doing with youth, um, with COVID, um, and uh, uh, pre uh, COVID. Um, as you realize, uh, and we all recognize that non-communicable diseases has been the leading cause of uh, mortality and, and morbidity. So uh, pre-COVID, uh, a lot of the work that we all did uh, is, was to support the countries in non-communicable diseases. But for this uh, session, I'll be sharing with you something that we're doing in COVID and also um, what's been done in the broader um, uh, health space. Um, FSM was quite uh, um, creative um, in developing We talked challenge uh, for for in two thousand. They encouraged uh, the encourage preventive measures. There were prizes offered. 
Um, and basically the objective was as a pre as a um, COVID free jurisdiction, the idea was to generate enough uh, awareness amongst the young population so that they would act uh, appropriately in the event of an outbreak, uh, practicing what uh, Sean had referred to the non pharmaceutical interventions. 21 uh, videos were received and, and over 23,000 views. I won't click on the link, but uh, it's available after the, the session. Following that uh, TikTok challenge in, tw in 2020, they also won this year, launched by the same players. Um, and this was around uh, vaccination. Again, platform that's very, um, there's a competition and the winner was uh, uh, awarded uh, a week of satar, uh, the, the, the youth um, as, a, as, a, as a mechanism and a, and a, and a, a platform to, to uh, support the, the, the whole of government and whole of community approach to addressing COVID. So some of the key lessons learned that we from this undertaking was that it's, we all understand that our youth are our leaders. So it's an opportunity um, to ensure we give them uh, the opportunity to keep abreast of emerging global issues, the complexities um, and implications, and of course the solutions to these so that they are, are well informed um, and, and make those decisions in a well-informed manner. Again, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, as an evolution, um, we moved away from traditional, traditional means of messaging um, and, and the advancement of technology and access in the Pacific is something that we should take advantage of. And I think the lesson, key lesson learned is that we need to ensure that we target the technology to, to those that are, are attractive to the youth. Um, and as, as I mentioned earlier, it creates an opportunity for conversation, awareness um, and education. The gamification technique is a beneficial tool because it's a very popular amongst um, uh, amongst youth and, and uh, uh, it, it increases increases uh, engagement uh, and ultimately knowledge transfer and acquisition amongst our youth population. So, so moving to to the, the, the more traditional, if you want to call it uh, pre COVID, um, we again recognize that the, the, the youth are a, a entry point in, in our battle against non-communicable diseases. And over the years, SPC has, be, has been receiving funding from the French Fund and we've uh, rolled a, a, a suite of activities related and using that to create awareness, uh, NC, NCD awareness. Um, uh, we brought together some youth from these countries listed there, Fiji, Tonga, Vanuatu, Waltz and Tutuna. Um, UNTV and, and SPC provided the technical support to throughout the, um, um, the training workshops. And the next slide uh, is, a, is a, a video of some NCDs and uncles of mine who have actually amputated legs because of their ignorance towards NCDs. So for us, uh, I know Fiji has uh, a growing increase in heart disease for rates in our country, so we definitely want to focus on heart disease and the impact it has on your body and your family, but mainly your body and what it does. Um, so we want to bring that message back to Fiji and hopefully give an impact. That's the first time I've ever heard of NCD. The thing that I've learned a lot here is how to work with spray cans and doing uh, I've learned a lot of uh, new techniques here from uh, our graffiti trainers and uh, being working as a team also like working as one and also um, techniques of uh, paintings and so I would like to encourage uh, young graffiti artists in the world uh, especially the Pacific Islands uh, just do what you love. If you are an artist, even if you're a graffiti artist or you are just a painter, do what you love. Um, promote. Uh, Pacific Island and also NCD, which is a serial killer.
Donald gone, you me, and me save and make him sick. All strong, hey, shoot, and me start with them you. You, you start finish long, spoil him hot, long you, spoil him body, long you. You, you spoil him smash, yeah, lifestyle, yeah, he save, make him cancer, save, make him sick. All same all NCDs, you just cast him 16, but you look 13. Fire, long you dead, no drink too much, no smoke him cigarette, or buy you sick too much. Boy, me tell him straight. MCD is top, he come on top, he get him dead, yeah. Too much, you don't find no way to stop, long sick, yeah. You me exercise, you me go, you, yeah. Got the mouse, smoke, alcohol, that guy good, yeah. MCD is top, he come on top to my, come on top to my, see, come on top to my. Uh, thank you, Sunia, for the for the presentation and apologies for the breakup. Uh, the connection is not good. And now we'll go to our next speaker. Uh, Uwe, the floor is yours. Good day. Thank you, Sebu. I'll be just speaking about the impact of COVID, we are people in Papua New Guinea. Uh, Papua New Guinea Red Cross Society involves volunteers, mainly young people to participate in the awareness campaign. Uh, Alasa, is it me or somebody else? Go ahead, Uwe, go. Okay, yeah. The way to involve the young people uh, is in volunteer participation, uh, doing awareness. And thanks to Australian Red Cross, IFRC, ICRC, and other partner side and companies like Coca-Cola to allow us to reach out to the people affected by COVID-19. And as our full representative, uh, mentioned Papua New Guinea is uh, one of those Pacific countries uh, affected by COVID-19 and it is impacting the economic lives of people. Uh, for an example, uh, traveling is restricted even within our own countries and there are six conditions that uh, cause us to make decisions so that we can travel for uh, uh, what purposes, like for Red Cross staff, when we are reaching out to other centers, we are allowed to travel, but for pu general public, it is hard for them to especially when there is a death in the family and our people uh, want to travel to another center to take the body, they are restricted. So with our normal, uh, what they call the nuclear passing uh, enacted by the parliament, sometimes it is hard to cope with all the orders given. So anytime that Papua New Guineans break any law, it is within that COVID-19 pandemic uh, duration. Uh, it also affects the cultural norms and traditional practices. Normally, Papua New Guineans are very highly communal uh, societies where gathering of families and communities uh, very, you know, free, frequently uh, is very frequent. Uh, but now with COVID-19, uh, the churches, family gatherings, bright price or death gatherings 
are limited and it affects some people because they cannot exercise well according to them as we reach out to them it is hard for young people uh, sports is restricted and where that's where young people normally want to uh, enjoy and also uh, social gatherings that's where young people are now rebelling or negatively reacting to COVID-19 orders. But one uh, of the things I may say that Papua New Guinea Red Cross is benefiting from is the Red Ready program. And uh, we are the only Pacific country that is participating in these nine uh, Asia Pacific region countries or societies participating in this program. And it is helping us. We have undergone a PER, uh, prepared for effective uh, response. This has given us, especially the younger uh, volunteers who have very little knowledge and skills in terms of preparedness and effective response to disasters. So during this pandemic, uh, Red Ready program is helping, although we are targeting only three branches, but this will be rolling out soon if we do this properly. And we thank you for the support provided by IFRC and also ARC, Australian Red Cross, who's standing with us as we go through all these programs. I think I will stop there, uh, Sebu, and allow any questions for others to uh, ask. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Pube, for sharing those uh, examples from, uh, from PNG. Uh, appreciate it. And now we'll go to our next speaker, uh, Vanila Kunasinga, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Sebu. Thank you for the invitation to share a little bit of our experience at FCOS on the role of young people, volunteers and young frontline workers and um, responders in the face of COVID-19 while responding to climate disasters. Um, FCOS was established in Fiji in 1957 and had been involved in disaster community response since the 80s, coordinating uh, voluntary organizations on disaster awareness and preparedness at the district level. Uh, F course is a membership based organization. Sorry, let me just start my video. Hi, everyone. Um, so yes, I, I was saying that F course is a membership based organization with five national NGOs as members and 50, uh, 15 district councils of social services across four um, Fiji's four administrative divisions. Um, with the help of Child Fund Australia, FCOS developed a CSO protocol for humanitarian coordination at the sub-national level between 2019 and 2020 and uh, proposed the National CSO Humanitarian Reporting Form uh, and a draft Fiji Humanitarian Code of Conduct for civil society organizations in 2020. Um, the discourse and the subsequent uh, development of these guides serve to uh, encourage and foster the meaningful participation of youth in our disaster response work. I do want to share that, you know, youth volunteerism has always existed in, in our communities. Um, uh, but, you know, specific pathways and support may have been limited um, and limited um, young people's continued contribution in disaster uh, response. What we saw in FCOS, which is, by the way, an intergenerational CSO platform, um, after these guides were developed was the, the increased support and willingness of youth to support disaster response programs. This was evidenced in the revival of our DCOS platforms across the, the four divisions and the subsequent increases in funding support for disaster response by the uh, Australian Humanitarian Partnership and, of course, from our regional platform, Biango. Youth have not only worked uh, at the district and the divisional level during responses to tropical cyclones, um, accessing the DCOS platforms to um, directly volunteer with the divisional commissioners and the provincial administrators, but they've also worked to access extra support from CSO donors to help meet needs of affected populations. 
Um, COVID-19 hit Fiji in 2020 before the arrival of TC Harold, if you recall, uh, when most of the humanitarian NGOs had activated their work from home policies, leaving a vacuum in the response space. Uh, of course, through the DCOS volunteers, majority of whom were, were youth, deployed across informal communities in the central western um, divisions and in parts of the north uh, to push out COVID-19 risk communication awareness. During this um, second wave of COVID-19 in Fiji, um, youth from DCOSs who had been assigned to assist government recovery efforts for TC Asa and TC Ana were asked to support divisional commissioners and provincial administrators with contact tracing, vaccination, and swabbing. In fact, 18, uh, no sorry, um, DCOSs um, or DCOS youth volunteers formed a, a non-medical team supporting SDMO Rewa with swabbing in the greater Nusori area. They had to be billeted away from their families and are still away from their families as I speak. Um, their ability to pivot from disaster response and recovery to a health crisis recognized as they were entrusted with additional responsibilities, including uh, logistics. Uh, other youth volunteers in across the DCOS networks have also been involved in food distribution. Um, post-disaster assessments and LTDD campaigns. Uh, this is not to say that COVID-19 has not had uh, negative impacts on youth. Four of the 18 youth volunteers from Nusori Dikos um, contracted 18, uh, sorry, contracted COVID-19 and had to isolate. Others lost their jobs and although this pushed them into volunteer work, the struggles of helping their families to put food on the table continues. Uh, issues of mental health have also been exacerbated during this crisis, and I'm thankful for organizations like Lifeline and Empower Pacific who've also pivoted um, their services to meet the needs of young people supporting the response. For me personally, having come from a youth development background and leading FCOS in its networks during this crisis, um, uh, it's been a learning curve. I've learned that as an NGO leader, I've got to go the extra mile uh, to remain engaged and responsive uh, as these youth volunteers are out in the field, to be ready to listen to their frustrations uh, and to reassure them you know, when, when um, what they're seeing on the ground overwhelms them. So no matter what time they call, I have to be um, ready to answer and to, to, to uh, I guess, um, make sense of some of what they're seeing on the ground. I've had to roster staff to check in with them virtually and physically on a weekly and a daily basis to ensure that they never you know, feel alone. Uh, of course, is an F course without young people and COVID-19 proved that uh, for us. Thank you, Seb. Thank you very much, Vani, for, for sharing those uh, examples uh, and stories with us. Uh, appreciate it. And now we'll move to, to Leslie. Uh, Leslie, the floor is yours. Hello and welcome to all. As we witness the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic around the globe on job loss, education and rights and mental health, you also have seen the actions taken and services provided to assist Surely it has affected everyone, but not all voices has been served and treated equally. Imagine this kind of marginalization. What if it happened to the Pacific, even to our beautiful nation in Fiji? Would you be outraged? Would you make a step? Sad news, it's happening in the Pacific, it's happening in Fiji. The untouchables I would like to talk about today are youths with disabilities. Before the COVID-19 and the cycle started our nations, Youth with disabilities are already finding difficulties from day to day due to lack of accessibility of the environment and accessible information. Youth with disabilities and their families still live at this point of disproportionately represented among people living in poverty. Poverty will limit the ability of youths and youths with disabilities to put place measures to res respond to the outbreak of increasing their vulnerability. Secondary impact of the COVID-19 of people with disabilities include increased disproportionate effects on livelihood as results a measure to restrict movement. As youth with disabilities who are more likely to work in informal work or self-employed with less labor protection. Going with the team to visit and create awareness in villages of VT11 on disaster risk and COVID-19, 
have witnessed the lack of information and participation of youth with disabilities, which is common around communities and villages. After TC Herald, children and youth with disabilities reported they received very little to no information about the different services. They could not communicate with those with humanitarian aid, and that some, but not all, news and updates on tropical cyclone hit side language interpreters. And the COVID outbreak Fiji, most youth with disabilities were confused and not known what's going on. The challenges faced during the cyclones and the COVID-19 pandemic has tested emergency plans for all levels of government, business, agencies, education, system, communities, families, and citizens in the Pacific, even here in Fiji. Many risk has been identified and challenges has risen through this pandemic and more continue to be identified as we move through the stages of emergency. Children and youths with disabilities are highly vulnerable to stigma, discrimination, and segregation for the rest of the society. A health system whereby places of vaccination, uh, vaccination, some areas are not accessible of information. We can, we can improve our health through accessible information and materials that needs to be made available in regards to what health or social care provisions of children and youths with disabilities can access during COVID-19. Accessible transport and health care services facilities and access treatment to COVID-19 needs to be provided to youth with disabilities. When we talk about information, accessible information and communication in various formats are essentials for youths with disabilities and their families and caregivers to be kept informed in prevention to support availability and keeping them safe is important. Resources needs to be available to support accessible information, including we have sign language interpretation and also braille to ensure the reach of diverse needs and requirements of children and youths with disabilities. Dissemination of information of COVID-19 needs to be locally community languages, easy to read, video text captioning, accessible web content and child friendly. In social distance for persons with disabilities, practice guidance must be provided to ensure much more possible social distancing to enhance and heed for children and youths with disabilities, taking into account various impairments, sensory needs, and intellectual disabilities. Children and young people with disabilities and their family, uh, families and caregivers must be provided with accessible and information regarding how to mitigate the risk of COVID-19. There also needs to be participation and representation of the meaningful with youths with disabilities, of sharing their various experiences, what matters to them and having their human rights protected. Youths and youths with disabilities need to be consulted, included and listened into COVID-19 responses and recovery programs. As we see in villages, young women and girls with disabilities have increased the risk of being excessively affected by COVID-19, particularly young women and girls from rural villages and rural areas. The essential items must be provided to young women and girls with disabilities to support their menstrual health, hygiene, and sexual reproductive health. Also, to monitor and ensure data compiled includes the impact of COVID-19 for young women and girls with disabilities, including information about barriers Thank you, Leslie. I think um, uh, we've uh, lost uh, Leslie uh, a bit, uh, but thank you, Leslie, for those uh, encouraging uh, words. Uh, as community. What is it? It's from my hair. I yes. wanted to and, uh, find Vivian, it. And uh, Vivian, over to you for the our rest and closing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, could I just remind the speakers to put your, your, um, your microphones on mute? Um, thank you very much uh, to everyone for sharing with us today. Um, and, and I think that there, there's just incredible information. Um, and if you just allow me to, to do a quick sum up, um, I think that we can all agree that young people have played an incredible part in the volunteering uh, systems that we have in place, that they've always done this. Um, and that during COVID-19, one of their key roles has been around awareness raising. Um, and uh, I'm uh, thankful to Sunir for sharing, with, for reminding us really that it's important that we um, ensure that we use the technology that's accessible to young people. 
Um, and he provided some wonderful examples of that uh, in terms of TikTok in uh, FSM, uh, but also the use of graffiti art and other art forms are uh, not only for COVID, but for other, uh, other related uh, issues. Um, I think Leslie has also made an incredibly important point uh, that accessibility needs to be for all people um, and that we uh, do need to uh, ensure, for example, that sign language uh, interpretation is available to all of our people, uh, that Braille is in available so that our communities are able to, uh, to, to read information. Um, I'm very thankful to Vani for sharing the, uh, the other examples of volunteering that has occurred. And uh, in, in this instance, the very specific uh, youth uh, component to um, the COVID response here in Fiji. Um, she referred to young people, particularly in the Nosori Dikos, being part of contact tracing teams, uh, being part of vaccination teams, being part of the swabbing teams. Um, and so Vani, please uh, thank all of the young people that have been part of this um, and please offer our encouragement uh, to them, uh, in particular the, the no sorry DCOS. Uh, importantly, uh, Vani mentioned mental health and its importance, uh, not only to young people, but to all of us. And this has been very uh, trying times uh, here in Fiji. And it's important that we remember that our frontliners whether they be youth or otherwise, um, have been in the thick of things for quite a while, and uh, know, would have a, uh, they know more about this than we do who sit at home and, and simply receive the information that they share. And so uh, to be thankful for that, but also recognizing that mental health is important and that we need, um, we, we need to ensure, we need to take care of that. Um, I'd like to just finish off by reiterating what Sean shared in terms of what, what can young people do um, from anywhere. And that is that uh, young people can continue to contribute through following the measures that have been put in place. Stay at home, use masks and follow all of those measures. And if you are over 18, remembering that youth is from 18, uh, from 15 to 25, some in some countries, 35. Uh, but if you are over 18, please get vaccinated. Uh, and also remembering that getting through COVID-19 is a shared responsibility. Uh, with that, I, I uh, thank all our speakers uh, for sharing with us today. Um, and I see that we, we have come to the end of our, our session. Uh, and so I certainly hope that uh, we've uh, been able to um, answer some of the questions that you may have had um, around this uh, issue, but also to just